Well, my friends, today we're taking a look at Tokugawa, Japan. Um, yeah, Tokugawa is sort of the golden era, running from about 1600 to about 1850, give or take. Um, you'll notice you're seeing right in front of you, you are seeing the social hierarchy within Japan. You know what? It's a little bit confusion, and it's strangely very, very parallel to what you'll see in Western Europe during the Middle Ages. But we'll take a closer look at that. Incidentally, in virtually every class I've ever taught, there is always a Japan kid, a kid who just loves Japan. They love manga. Their dream is to go to Japan. If it's Japan, it's cool. The Japanese this, the Japanese that, and wondering if there is one in this group. There's something about Japan that really appeals to a certain percentage of people. A couple quick definitions. Uh, we have the daimyo in Japan. You know what those are? Those are feudal lords. If you want to think about the lords with their knights in medieval Europe, that's kind of what we're talking about, uh, based upon land ownership and the ability to raise an army to protect your land and ideally expand your land. We've got the shogun. The sh you know what the shogun is? It's the number one feudal lord. It's the one who takes control over all the others. Honestly, in Western Europe, what would we call that? the dominant lord becomes the king. And it's not that the other lord wouldn't like to take the king's power, but they can't. This is the guy who becomes dominant and becomes de facto the king within Japan, although called the shogun. Then you've got the samurai, and everybody knows the term samurai. You know what samurai are? They're knights. That's what they are. They are like the knights of the round table. They are the people that were trained from birth to be powerful, powerful fighters, to surrender their lives for their lord and eventually for the shogun, who again is sort of the king. This is tricky. We've got the ronin, and the ronin are actually a source of a lot of trouble within Japan. These are masterless, wandering samurai. What I mean by this, particularly as the Tokugawa regime becomes stronger and forces the local daimyo, the local lords, to submit, what they end up doing is saying, you know what, you got to get rid of your private army. You've got to release a lot of your samurai and no longer arm them. So what have you got? You've got a roaming class of people who used to be considered elite in society and now have lost their position. They've been trained since virtually birth to be military folks, to be fighters. Uh, they're highly trained in weapons, and they're kind of wandering the countryside with nothing to do. And you can see how that might be a problem. And then in theory, on top of all of this, you have the emperor. Now, the emperor to the Japanese is descended from the sun god. I mean, this is, this is you know, a mandate of heaven, if you want to think about it that way, or the divine right of kings. But in reality, for the most part during the Tokugawa period, the emperor is just a guy who sits on a throne. And it's really the shogun, the king, the military leader who controls Japan. The emperor is treated with great respect and he's bowed down to in all of this, but the real power comes from the shogun. And so if you go back to that last screen, you will see that the shogun is on top with the emperor in theory above him, but with fairly limited power. So generally speaking, during the so-called Middle Ages, and here we are talking, oh, I don't know, the 13, 14, maybe 1500s, uh, Japan, although it's a small island, is not particularly unified. The major daimyo, constant fighting among them. They have their private, uh, their private armies of samurai, and they're fighting to take land and power. Again, there is an emperor who is at least in theory recognized. Again, the descendant of Jimmu, the sun god, yeah, Jimmu is the first emperor, by the way, but with no real power and certainly no ability to bring it together. Japan, and this is, of course, so different from what you'll see in Western Europe, and even to it, certainly within India, which, of course, is a dominant power, and what you see is the Islamic empires, there really is no particular Japanese religion. I mean, Confucianism comes over from China, plays a major role. Uh, Buddhism gets to Japan through China. It was called Chang Buddhism. It becomes known as Zen Buddhism. The Japanese developed that. Shintoism, which becomes pretty important by the 19th century. Man, it is a combination of anything and everything but Japanified. Japanesified? I don't know what the word would be. 
what we're seeing is rituals. It's worship of nature, of the emperor. Um, often it's not, you know, you, you think about the Japanese tea ceremonies and the shrines that are set up and so forth. Uh, something hard to wrap a Judeo-Christian Islamic brain around because it's not a matter of, well, I will worship God and God will reward me. It's really about doing things the right way as a Japanese person. And there are, at least for a while, as the early Jesuits start appearing in the 16th century, you start seeing reasonable conversion to Japan, uh, to Christianity in Japan. You might ask yourself for a second and maybe think about this. Why would it seem that the Japanese tend to convert to Christianity more than the Chinese? Because remember, China's population is 10, 20 times bigger, but only fewer than a quarter million Christians. Stop the film for a second and ask yourself if you can think why. Honestly, I don't have an answer. This thought just occurred to me. Uh, I guess two things I'm thinking about is that China, of course, is so incredibly vast whereas the missionaries coming into Japan probably had a better chance to reach a bigger part of the population. I think also China, of course, was so incredibly stable during the Ming period when the explorers and the Jesuits started coming, there was no real need to look for other answers. Japan, however, as mentioned, kind of a period of civil war, some chaos. There is no dominant religion or, or belief system, so maybe people are more interested in stuff. There is definitely a Confucian political system. You know, the Japanese, one thing the Japanese have been great at, they are tremendous borrowers. Uh, as the story goes, in like the 7th or 8th century, the Japanese emperor kept hearing about the power of, at this point, would be the Tang Dynasty. And he sent people over to say, hey, go to China. Find out what they're doing at the imperial court. Write it all down, and I'm going to do it here. And in fact, they did this. Uh, Japanese writing, quite different from Chinese, but it's based on the Chinese script to begin with. Confucianism came from China. Buddhism came from China. Uh, as you'll see toward the end of this section and into the next unit, uh, when Japan starts to fall behind the West, they in effect look out to the world and say, who's powerful in the 1860s and 70s? Why, it's the Americans, it's the English, it's the Belgians, it's the Germans. Well, what are they doing that we're not? Well, they have representative governments, i.e. parliaments or congresses, and they've modern industrialized. And the Japanese simply copy what the Westerners are doing, and, and they do it magnificently. In World War II, as you know, the Japanese are bombed out. They are destroyed. There is nothing left standing. What do the Japanese do? They copy what Westerners are doing. They didn't invent the car, the radio, the computer, they took what Westerners were doing and simply did it better. And you see this with the Confucian system. It's absolutely, they take it from China and adapt to Japanese needs. Now, a little bit trick here. The merchant is also at the bottom, although it's a little bit less absolute than in China. Um, and one thing that's really tricky is in the cities, and most Japan is not city at this point, but you start seeing wealthy independent merchants and they become extraordinarily influential because they have the money, but similar to China. Honestly, if we talk about a feudal system in Europe with a few large landowners competing, they all have their private armies of knights or samurais. Um, one tries to get the most control, one daimyo lord to become king, and the vast, vast majority are peasants, are serfs living on these lands with no particular rights. Honestly, this is a smaller version of feudalism in Europe, and it's not really that different. A question I've been asked over the years, were the Japanese aware of directly of the European system, and did they borrow or copy? And that's actually a great question that I've never known how to find out, but I'd be curious to know that someday. Someday before I die, I'd like to know that. Again, a borrower nation. Generally speaking, Japan was very, very open to outsiders. They didn't have a dominant religion they're protecting, the purity of Confucianism or of Hinduism at all. And, you know, it makes sense. If these daimyo are competing with each other and trying to gain more land and power, well, they'd be really interested in foreign trade or technology. You know, for the most part, they take the Chinese culture to be sure. You also see as a way of gaining wealth that the local clan leaders, the daimyos, the local lords, 
Well, they begin to sponsor pirates, and they go into the what we call the East China Sea. The Japanese and Koreans call it something else. Uh, up the Yangtze River into China. And remember, that was one of the problems with the Ming Dynasty, is they began to go heavily in debt because of these pirates. The fact that Japanese pirates are able to go into Chinese territory and go up the Yangtze River and attack ships, boy, that suggests that the Ming Dynasty is losing control, losing the mandate of heaven. Absolutely, that's one of the warning signs. So quite often in this class, I try to point out potential prom dates. Uh, now, you may not be interested yourself in bringing a male to the prom, and that's fine up to any individual, but you might think of somebody you know, a family member interested. Could I recommend Toyotoma Hideyoshi? Um, I think the picture speaks for itself. Interesting, he is not actually a Tokugawa. That's the next family, but he's the unifier of Japan. Really interesting. Peasant stock means he was born poor. He was a stable hand, I think. He took care of horses. And through some combination of skill, of strength, of luck, of circumstances, and it all ties together, he be began to raise his own private army, eventually took over a huge part of land, and put his control over the rest of Japan. And really, that carried on for the next few hundred years. He dies in 1598. Obviously, now we need a new king or shogun. And that will come in a moment. Uh, domestically, well, he centralized power, so-called sword hunts. He would send his well-armed samurai knights out into the countryside and collect all the swords. There's no gunpowder in Japan. That technology did not make it to Japan. So collecting the swords from the rival daimyo samurais. Um, simply, when other uh, daimyo said, well, you're just a stable hand. I'm not taking, I'm not taking orders from you. He would send in the, arm, the soldiers that he had raised to just destroy them. Um, generally, peers, generally, a lot of people actually accepted this. I mean, you could find a lot of daimyo that were not happy with having to pay allegiance to Hideyoshi uh, Toyotoma. On the other hand, he did bring a stability and a peace to Japan. Remember, there had been a couple centuries of on-again, off-again civil war. Again, we talk about how there is a caste system. Now, it's not religious-based like in Hinduism. It's more Chinese, although you will recall that in China, you could be born very, very poor and rise to almost the highest levels, Confucius being an example. Remember that nearly half of the Ming Mandarin scholars, the Confucian scholars, came from fairly poor or at least modest backgrounds. There were laws against this in Japan. So it was a caste system, but it really did kind of keep people in their place. Again, exceptions to be sure. Hey, Toyotoma Hideyoshi is one of them to be sure. Basically, what we're talking about, a Confucian feudalism. And that sounds kind of odd in a way, but it has the structure, the hierarchy. And again, the Japanese have been traditionally very, very willing to say, if it works, we're going to do it. By the way, seppuku, many of you know this, it is a ritual suicide that if the daimyo or the samurai had let down his master, had, had not lived up to his honor, had been dishonest, had been embarrassed, it was the expectation that he would take his sword and stab himself to death. By the way, we often think it's you take it, you stab it in the stomach, you die. Actually, you would plunge it into your lower belly, and I appreciate this, make a giant Z across your stomach, up through your chest and ribs, and through the other part, completing the Z through the top. Possibly in honor of me, but I'm not certain. Again, here are the numbers, the warriors, the knights, and that includes, of course, the shogun, who is really an ex-samurai, the daimyo controls the samurai, etc., about one in 20 people, not a big part of the population. Next highest, most respected, the farmers. Here's a problem though, although they were highly respected, they were the people of the land, they fed the people, often they lived desperately. 20% of their crops in general went to the shogun, the local daimyo took more. If there was a famine, well, these people died by the thousands, by the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. So they were socially respected, but the vast, vast majority didn't live very well. 
You've then got the craftspeople, you've got the sword makers, the silk makers, the artists, etc., or the official royal artists. And then toward the bottom, you've got the merchants. They're called the chonin. Now, they are absolutely looked down upon. They are sneered at, but they're very, very wealthy, of course. And the Japanese government depends on them, and eventually you'll see conflicts about that. Then you've also got what they call the floating world. Now, they're called etas, E-T-A is the name of the caste. You know, we can translate that to untouchables in Hinduism, but there's some big difference. First of all, there's no idea of defilement, of, you know, ritually doing something wrong, damaging your soul, anything like that. <coughs> they were just considered to be outsiders and actually, rather than living miserable, miserable, horrible, horrible lives, they lived in the big cities. And they tended to be entertainers. They tended to be people that just simply lived in their own world. They weren't really touched by the system, which meant there was a lot of freedom, flexibility. It was, you know, kind of a wild and crazy life. Uh, that's where you would find the, you know, the partiers, the informal business people, et cetera, et cetera. We'll touch on that in a little bit, in a moment. 1587, and by the way, following, of course, what the Chinese did, foreign missionaries were banned by, by Hideyoshi. However, there was concern because the Europeans by this point were bringing in gunpowder weapons and certain knowledge and technology. So it was a formal ban, but actually foreigners continued to arrive in Japan. Uh, there's a huge invasion in 1592. Now, Korea, with no disrespect to Korea in itself, has limited value. However, if the Japanese could gain a foothold in Korea, it's then a possible move into Manchuria and eastern China. By the way, we see this in the 20th century. In 1910 or so, Japan formally annexes China, uh, Korea and then moves into Manchuria in 1931, and by the mid-30s is attempting to take over China itself. Um, it, it fails, and actually this is... It cost Japan a lot of money to do this. Uh, Hideyoshi dies in 1597. He is converted into a deity, that Shinto faith, which is awfully hard to summarize in a few words. But he became one of these sources of ancestor wisdom, of knowledge, of um, respect and honor that people would begin to perform rituals for. <clears throat> Iyasu Tokugawa, probably not as appealing a prom date as Hideyoshi Toyotoma, but pretty darn close. Yep, this is the Tokugawa shogunate, and this is passed on from family again and again for the next 250 years. Generally speaking, this is seen to be a high point in Japan. Peace, prosperity, but I wish I knew the historian who used these words because I love the language. The corset-like binding covered up underlying problems. Now, your first question might be, what is a corset? That is a corset. Stop for a second and see if you can explain what this metaphor might be getting to, because what does this have to do with that? And of course, what we're looking at is the idea that the corset, which was very, very tight, was made to hide underlying problems, weight gain, etc., etc. Well, that's the idea that the incredible control that the Tokugawa shogunate held over Japan, oh sure, on the outside it looks like peace, prosperity, growth, but there were some pretty major problems underneath it that revealed themselves in the 19th century. The new capital, modern-day Tokyo, was called Edo. Um, in a simple century, you think about this, population growth 30%. Japan has been inhabited for, I don't know, seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 years, and suddenly within 100 years, a 30% population growth. Agricultural production doubled. By the way, if food sources double, population grows by only 30%, that would suggest more people are eating better. The Tokugawas absolutely controlled the other daimyo, and they did what they need to, from taking all of their swords, the sword hunts, they taxed them heavily, they weren't allowed to trade independently, and I'll tell you what, if I want to take control over you, I might force you to come visit my house for a month every year and leave your most valued family members with me. 
so you cause any trouble when you go back to your home domain, I think you know what'll happen to your family members. Again, you might say, well, why would the other daimyo agree? They didn't have a choice. The Tokugawa's had sort of a monopoly of power, monopoly of violence. They were able to enforce this. The Tokugawa's, although Japan had traditionally been open to outsiders, relied on outside ideas. There is a sense, remember, Japanese, like most other cultures, see themselves as absolutely unique. I mean, you know, America is the greatest country on earth, bar none. No, no, China is the Middle Kingdom. Ah, all roads go through Russia. No, no, Mecca. You, you see this every place. And there is a sense, as the Tokugawa's gained control, of let's go back to our ancient ways. Let's start, for example, by banning Christianity, because that's an outside influence that is a rival to our power. And you see massive executions. We'll mention this. Ships, hey, this is what the Chinese had done 200 years earlier. They limited the sizes and they closed the ports. And by tradition, every day, every year on Christmas, a single Dutch ship was allowed to enter the city of Nagasaki. I should say Nagasaki, by the way, with a G. Nagasaki might ring a bell. It was the place where the second atomic bomb was dropped in August of 1945. I do want to point out that it wasn't actually limited to this. There were ways for other outsiders to get in and out, etc. But at least officially, Japan was pretty closed off, like China was. The Bushido Code, again, the Warriors Code, um, absolutely, honor matters above all. Now, we got to be careful here because we can't simply say, oh, all of those 120 million people are like that. That's kind of how racism begins. However, certain cultures had certain things that seemed to matter more. If I were to say to you, what does it mean to be American from the United States? A lot of people say freedom. Why? Because we say that we value freedom. You talk to a lot of Americans, we are the only free people in the world and nobody comes close. That's nonsense, but that's an important thing in the United States, individual freedom. Uh, in Japan, what has mattered more is a sense of honor. Uh, individual freedom, no, no, we are a collective group and doing what is honorable is what matters more. Uh, for the for the samurai, if they were dishonored, if they let down their master, if they had behaved dishonorably and found out, it was very common to commit suicide, that ritual hari kari or sakupu, as it was called. Now, again, be careful. You meet a Japanese person at college and you say, hey, is it true that like you'd rather like kill yourself than have me call you stupid? And the Japanese person being probably sensible say, no, go ahead and call me stupid. I can live with dishonor. But it has played a stronger role in Japanese culture than in other. The so-called martyrs of Nagasaki, recognized by the Catholic Church, these were something like, I don't know, 37 Catholic converts who were, well, they were crucified by the Tokugawa emperor. And again, crucifixion, we say it lightly, but imagine what that that means. So an attempt to drive Christianity and foreign influence out. There's a whole lot of words here. We've already talked about the floating words, the urban culture, the people that are kind of outside of the traditional caste system within Japan. They adopt Neo-Confucianism, in other words, Confucian form of government, but open to more spiritual ideas. Uh, they tried to Japanify it a little. They called it the school of national learning. So we take Confucianism, but we make it a Japanese form of that. And that included Shintoism. Uh, Japanese uh, Buddhism becomes quite separate. It becomes its own version uh, with focus. Well, don't know too much about Zen Buddhism, but most samurai would practice that. So-called Dutch learning. And now here's the exception. In theory, all outsiders are closed out except for a symbolic once a year Dutch ship. But actually, you would find Dutch traders and Dutch scholars allowed to come in. And this was called Dutch learning. Um, people were allowed to read Dutch language books. A lot of the Japanese elite actually learned the Dutch language. And again, the whole sort of idea is Man, by 1700s, by the 1750s, you know what? Europeans simply have access to technology, knowledge, understanding that we don't. And you find that the shoguns themselves began to really value this because, look, the Europeans, for reasons we'll discuss later, had simply advanced 
technologically and academically, intellectually, in ways that the Japanese who had been closed off had not. And here's where I know nothing about anything, just giving you some idea that ukiyo-e art, you can look at these, honestly, these traditional forms of Japanese art have never done a lot for me, but worth having a look at. You'll notice that a lot of them, now obvious exception here, but very often people are not particularly emphasized. And if you might compare this to the Renaissance and post-Renaissance art in Europe, why it's people, 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 man is the measure of all things, much more emphasis on nature, very, very famous wave painting. You've probably seen this before and you will certainly see it again. Again, a few more images. If you find them beautiful and intriguing, stop and look. Otherwise, I shall move on. Kabuki theater, I know nothing about. Again, I don't know a lot about Japanese culture, but it's a term that you hear about. These were traditional plays with masks, uh, uh, often silent, just simply through movement, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> the geishas, <clears throat> excuse me, the geishas, um, by the way, often we think, oh, geisha girl means prostitute. Actually, not necessarily and often not at all. Yes, these were female entertainers, so-called persons of the arts, and that sounds like a euphemism for something naughty, but, but not the case by any means. Uh, gentlemen would pay to have them as companions and sometimes pay them well, but it wasn't simply about sex and often didn't involve sex. It, to be a geisha, you had to be highly trained, a dancer, a writer, a poet, well-read. You know the tea ceremonies, music, singing, flower arrangement, which is huge. Basically, you would often find these men come in for deep, in-depth conversations about things that they couldn't. And to be sure, there were concubine setups, there were sexual arrangements as well, but it was not necessarily the expectation and often was not involved at all. Finally, the Tokugawa's do decline, and it happens very quickly in the 18, in 1850s to 1860s. You know, what was there? Again, we mentioned this corset-like binding where all the unpleasantness, all the difficulty was covered up, but there was still stuff there. The clans and the daimyo rivalries, they were there. The daimyo always wanted to take power from the shogun, just couldn't. Peace meant, ah, we've got these armed samurai who have nothing to do with their time. They don't have a master. They're not engaged in war. These are the ronin, and, well, often they move around the countryside. They become bandits. They try to form their own centers of power. That creates trouble. As always, look, this is an expensive court, and it's very, very tempting. We see this as power begins to consolidate itself. It wants more and more, and a lot of the peasants are desperately overtaxed, underfed, etc. The merchants, the low life of society, oh, we don't like them at all. We, yeah, but they dominate the country economically. And when you get a conflict like that, where the lowest in theory is really dominant in some ways, that creates a conflict. Uh, Shintoism becomes more and more powerful, and I don't quite understand the mechanism, but it ended up being a religious belief or practice or spiritual practice that people who were opposed to the Tokugawas began to gravitate toward. And the Westerners, they're not shut off. It's not just the one ship or the occasional Dutch learning. More stuff is coming in. And probably the other thing that I've got to put here, look, the Tokugawa are more powerful in 1850 than they were in 1600. They have developed technologically. The population has grown. But overall, if you describe the growth of Japan technologically, population-wise, etc., really in, from 1600 to 1850, the growth is fairly modest. The real key is that European countries are growing massively technologically militarily. And that's ultimately, it's a relative weakness of the Tokugawa. And you'll see how this will play out in our next unit.